Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a nearly 200-year-old university opens a satellite campus in the valley. Also tonight, we'll hear about efforts to preserve historic buildings at the state fairgrounds, and we'll visit with a New York Times best-selling science fiction writer. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Two separate groups of bounty hunters are being questioned after mistakenly attempting to raid the home of Phoenix Police Chief Joseph Yonner. Arizona Republic reports that the incident occurred at about 10 o'clock last night after the fugitive recovering agencies received false information that a fugitive was hiding at the police chief's address. The owner of one of the agencies was arrested this morning on charges of criminal trespassing and disorderly conduct. Arizona State University Ice Hockey today announced a partnership with the Arizona Coyotes. The agreement calls for the ASU team playing at Glendale's Gila River Arena for four games during the season and hosting a Division I hockey tournament, the first of its kind for the Valley. To partner with such a great organization that's committed to hockey here in the Valley um, is, is a special opportunity. You know, they could easily have turned their nose to this whole thing and They've welcomed us and embraced us with open arms, and it speaks volumes to uh, the character of, of the ownership group that's currently in charge over there. The rest of ASU hockey's regular season will be played at Oceanside Ice Arena in Tempe. St. Xavier University is a historic Chicago-based school that this week opened its first satellite campus. The location? Gilbert, Arizona. St. Xavier is also working to partner with ASU on a plan that would allow students to take courses at each institution. Joining us now is the president of St. Xavier University, Dr. Christine Wiseman. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, and welcome to Arizona, too. Describe St. Xavier University for us. St. Xavier University is uh, nearly 170 years old. It is the oldest Catholic institution of higher education in the city of Chicago. It is the oldest of 17 uh, mercy institutions across the United States, and it is now the first uh, higher education institution in the town of Gilbert. Interesting, and, and founded by the Sisters of Mercy? It was. Back in 1846. 1846. What part of Chicago now are you based in? We actually are on uh, a street called 103rd in Pulaski, which really uh, is the demarcation of the southwest corner of the city of Chicago. Okay, how many students in general do you have in Chicago? In Chicago, we have about 4,400 students, about 3,000 undergraduate students, and the others are graduate students um, who either attend classes or attend online. This sounds like a historic university. It, it figured out how to do things a long time ago and probably doing them pretty well. Why expand and why expand to Gilbert, Arizona? Well, actually, I would say initially it was not planned. It was um, the result of uh, an offer to make contacts by a business faculty member who was then employed at St. Xavier University who had professional contacts and I think even a brother who was professionally occupied in Gilbert, Arizona and knew the goal of Gilbert to bring a private faith-based higher education institution to the town itself. So when talks initiated, was it just kind of a hello, how are you kind of thing or both sides pretty interested from the get-go. Well, I think that initially we had a conference call to see whether this was an opportunity that was viable, whether it was an opportunity that we would pursue because it was both appropriate for us and, um, you know, and, and appropriate to yeah. the town. And so we had that initial conversation and then we met in 2012 at the town offices and I think we met for a period of four or five hours to talk about various aspects that would result in some mutuality. And I think we came away really, really liking the town, liking the people that we had met. We also found that there was a mutuality in what they sought in faith-based higher education and the needs of their own townspeople. It almost sounds in some ways serendipitous here. It, I would say 
It was. I mean, it was not obviously when you are a 170 year old institution that began serving, you know, the needs of populations that were historically underserved. It's not something that you consider doing initially. Talk more about that because I know that the majority of your students in Chicago now my first generation and first minority. First generation, 61 percent first generation. If we look at our uh, applicants for our first year entering class. They are 48% Hispanic and Spanish speaking students. They are about 15% African American. They are about 30% white. And then there are 2% Asian. And we have an additional 2 or 3% who are of many ethnicities. Is that a point of emphasis or is that just evolution? You know, I think it is the evolution that comes with um, a mission of bringing higher education to underserved populations. In 1846, they were women and girls who otherwise had no access to higher education. Now, of course, you know, for the first time in history, I think women are the uh, largest majority in the workforce of, of uh, the 21st century. And so it began with women and girls and it has continued to serve the needs of an underserved population. That's our mission. You know, our mission is to create people who understand the need for serving the community as well. Can that mission transfer to a relatively wealthy uh, suburb of Phoenix, Arizona? You know, I think it can. I think that from what we've seen, the population and from the uh, response that we've had to our presence among all constituencies in and around the town of Arizona, or the town of Gilbert, we have seen that people are really interested, very interested. They send inquiries to us, you know, they've, they've now made efforts to tour the new building. Mm -hmm. And that new building, four-story building, right there in downtown Gilbert, It is huh? right in the historic district. Plans for expansion? Not immediately, but as the population of our uh, students develops, as their needs develop, we will make those decisions long term with the town of Gilbert. You mentioned population of students. How many do you expect? This is the first year now, obviously, mm -hmm. classes you know, just starting. What are you thinking now and what are you thinking in the future? Well, we actually have an enrollment plan. It was part of the development plan that we negotiated with the town of Gilbert. Anytime you bring a new institution of different dimensions to a community. It's going to take some time for the community to know and acclimate to that institution and its program offerings. I mean, you know, there were many people initially who did not know St. Xavier University. Right. And so um, we have an enrollment plan that, that probably will call for 50 to 75 students this first year, but by year six, we expect to fill that building with 550 graduate and undergraduate students. My goodness, and, and again, uh, academic emphasis, nursing, education. Business. Business, those and, are the big three? And professional studies. We will begin with degree completion programs in business and professional studies, which is located uh, within our College of Ar Arts and Sciences, and then we hope um, in August to expand to a, uh, August of 2016, I should say, to expand to a pre-licensure undergraduate program in nursing. And, um, and also we are bringing graduate programs in education. These are programs that have already proven to be very successful, particularly for the populations we serve. And uh, we should mention as well that uh, Gilbert now will own that building, it right? Will. And, and they'll lease it to you. Yes. Okay, and you're okay with that? Yes, we are. I mean, you know, that was the uh, original agreement. It was Gilbert's initiative to bring higher education, I think not only as a learning institution, but also as a community resource. But they worked with us, you know, to find state-of-the-art needs, what we would need for state-of-the-art nursing programs or education programs. And then they worked to uh, build that building to those specifications. It sounds like ASU is willing to work with you as well. Talk to us about that. You know, it's, it's quite exciting. But we not only have ASU, we also have the colleges of Maricopa County working with us at uh, transfer and degree completion programs. But 
Our relationship with ASU began, I think, when representatives of ASU came to those initial meetings at which I would present, you know, the vision for St. Xavier University and the joint vision for the town of Gilbert and St. Xavier University. And from that, uh, Dr. Michael Crow, back in 2013, issued an invitation to me to appear at a panel discussion, it was a dinner discussion, uh, at the Penn Club of New York. And he and I did a lot of uh, talking, both before and after that, and, and during that panel discussion, we found that there was a lot of mutuality in the student population that we were serving and in the programs that we had. And the fact that ASU's got the Polytechnic out there uh, in Mesa, and they've got the main campus there in Tempe, and you're kind of a little triangle there in, in, uh, uh, in the middle there in uh, Gilbert, not, not a problem, huh? No, you know, I, I also serve on the Illinois Board of Higher Education, and I need to tell you that we have nine public institutions across 12 campuses and 97 private independent institutions that are not for profit in the state of Illinois. You know, we always say we have to work collaboratively to meet the needs of the community and the, and the, and the populations that they serve. So it's really not a question yeah. of numbers. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. uh, it's going to feel like the wide open west out here compared <laughs> to that. Well, welcome to Arizona. Thank Congratulations you. and good luck. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. A deadline to raise funds to preserve the 1938 WPA administration building at the Arizona State Fairgrounds has come and gone, but the building still stands and efforts to keep it at the fairgrounds continue. Videographer Langston Fields and producer Cassie Enfinson take a look at efforts to save the building. The Civic WPA administration building. This is our key concern, saving this particular building, because it's got sort of a bulldozer on its head. Uh, last August, we discovered a bulldozer outside it, and so concerned citizens, preservationists, and everything gathered around to see what we could do to save it. It needs 100% restoration. The stucco is, is pulling away from the adobe walls. The windows need care and attention. It's also that, for example, the plumbing and the electrical are original. So it's time to upgrade. They look at um, how, what's revenue and what's stagnant and not bringing in revenue. They know that they can get revenue from parking. So sadly, if this building was to come down, it would be for parking. All of the buildings need maintenance. If you look around the fairgrounds, all the buildings are structurally sound. They have incredibly good bones, but they look tired. We're talking quite a bit of money, and the fairgrounds doesn't have it. If we can get that maintenance program established, then all the buildings are a part of that. What we'd like to do is create sort of a fund that builds on itself. So in addition to looking at one building, the group of buildings, we're also looking at the future of the fairgrounds. And to do that, we need measured drawings. What we want to do is have quality measured drawings for these buildings. To do it the traditional way, it would take you months because of the size of the buildings. So today we have a technology called laser scanning. Laser scanning comes in and it will basically shoot lasers in a rapid fire uh, succession to uh, record every point of a building. We can do that in about a week maybe. 
As far as the laser scanning for here and the importance of it here on the fairgrounds is it gives us those measured drawings so at any time any restoration is done we can look at those drawings and we know that building intimately. If the building is, is significantly important then the, the uh, drawings can go to the Library of Congress and be stored there. This building behind me, the Civic Building, has got an August 1 sort of deadline and we don't have all the money we need and our biggest problem has been getting the word out. I think that if we talk about right here and now and who would be most interested in these fairgrounds, you're going to get outsiders, but it's going to be the, the people that live here in this state. If every family and business in the state of Arizona gave one dollar, we would, we would be able to do it all. Those working to save the building will present their preservation plan for the site to state fair officials tomorrow. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. New York Times bestselling author Paolo Bacigalupi has a new book out that is set mostly in Phoenix. The Water Knife tells the story about the near future when the American Southwest has been decimated by drought. When a game-changing water source is found in Phoenix, a spy and assassin, also known as a water knife, is sent to investigate. We spoke to Paolo Bacigalupi about his new novel. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You know, I'm getting through this book, and this is this is quite. The, I mean, this there's a lot going on in here, <laughs> a lot happening at all times. How did the idea? For, it's dystopian to a certain degree. American Southwest water. How'd you come up with all this? Uh, well, I've always been interested in the in southwestern water issues because I used to work for an environmental magazine called High Country News, and uh, so I followed a lot of science journalists. I was the online editor there. And the science journalists who were reporting on the issues in the Southwest were people like Matt Jenkins, who was reporting on how Lake Powell was getting lower and lower, and how Lake Mead was getting lower and lower, and how Las Vegas was digging deeper and deeper into Lake Mead to get water, things like that. Um, but also people like Michelle Nyhouse were reporting on climate change and how that was already affecting uh, the ecosystems in the, in the western United States. And all that was happening, uh, you know, I think this, I first started thinking about this maybe 10 years ago, and yeah. stuff was already happening. And, since then, it's only gotten more and more interesting. So I, uh, yeah, it sort of uh, sucked me in, I guess. So describe the novel's landscape, because again, this is the future, and it, it feels like it's a little bit out in the future, but not that far out in the future, right. and things are very different than they are now. Right, yeah, it's sort of the 20 minutes into the future sort of feeling. Um, so this, in this future, uh, the, the, there have been mega droughts that have been sweeping through the country and, and changing the landscape quite a lot. So there are massive forest fires that are happening. There are huge dust storms that are occurring. Um, Las Vegas and Phoenix are sort of locked in a, in a, in a fight for water uh, and each of them has terrible water rights on the Colorado River and so they're each trying to sort of jockey for position. But uh, unfortunately for Phoenix, Las Vegas has planned better. Yeah, I was going to say Las Vegas seems to have the upper hand here. They certainly have a, a better uh, a militia out there. I, I guess they're kind of a militia. The water knife and Angel, the, the, the main character, the, the water knife, describe them, describe him. So water knives are basically sort of the 007s of water, and they're the, they're the people who go out for, on behalf of Las Vegas. Las Vegas has sort of hired this cadre of, of thugs, basically, who will go out and give people offers on their water rights that they can't refuse. They'll blow up other people's water treatment plants, um, and all, all the time while giving Las Vegas a certain plausible deniability. It's like, well, we don't know what happened over there. We don't know sad about that explosion there, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. And, but all the time uh, ensuring that Las Vegas has enough water to keep their economy going and keep their sort of arcologies running. Arcologies, so. and these are actually these these kind of weird indoor kind of self-sustaining systems that, that I guess the, the haves have and the have-nots just kind of look at. Right. They're they're almost entirely self-contained cities. You know, there's living environments, there's there's recreational environments. In in Las Vegas, they've built these giant arcologies called the Cypress Arcologies, and they've got hanging gardens and waterfalls and, and everything that comes into them just eternally gets recycled and kept. So all the water that comes in, they reuse and reuse. Um, all of their waste is reused and everything, and and, uh, and that's their sort of solution to the to the increasingly devastating outside environments that they're dealing with. 
For something like this, what comes first? Do the characters come first, or does the scenario come first? Theme for me, oftentimes, so there is, is the a first theme thing. There. Yeah, and I think for me, like this one, originally the, the the thing that kicked me off to write this book was that I was down in Texas in 2011 during their droughts, and I was just astounded at how bad things were. Um, but one of the things that really struck me was that in the middle of this terrible drought down in Texas where farmers are putting their cattle down because the land can't support them and they're having rolling brownouts because they don't have enough water in their dams to generate hydroelectricity, um, at that same time as all that's happening, you realize that climate data basically indicates that's likely to be the new normal for Texas. Um, and that's really striking. Um, but then even more than that, uh, what was striking was that Rick Perry, who is once again a presidential candidate, um, was going around and encouraging people to pray for rain. Um, and that, for me, thematically was really interesting. The idea that we know we're going in a certain direction and then that our leadership is uh, uh, in denial about it, essentially. And what kind of future does that create? And then you start creating characters in that future and start to live right. in it and try to find out what it feels like. Do characters ever surprise you? Yes, um, oftentimes, actually. Uh, the very beginning of a story, you're writing the characters and you're trying to build them out and trying to see who they are and what they, what they desire and, and where they're going to go. And you think you kind of have a handle on it. But uh, Maria actually turns out to be Interesting. Um, a far more, the, Maria is a, a Texas refugee. And she's um, fled from Texas and sort of washed up in Phoenix and can't get anywhere else because there's all these state border control laws. And, and she's very much a second class citizen in a place that's already falling apart. Um, because nobody wants Texans when everybody else is struggling anyway. Um, not like I'm biased or anything. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, uh, but she actually goes from a place of being extremely powerless to a very different spot. And I didn't see that coming in the story. That was very much a surprise to me. Where she ends up is a very, very different thing than I originally had planned for her. That's interesting because when theme kind of takes precedent over character and, and, and over landscape and these sorts of things, it can be dangerous, and I'm sure you're right. aware of this, to be being didactic, sure. being going through yeah. a, an outline as opposed to letting things play out and breathe. I let the characters do what they want. Thematically, what you're doing is the theme builds, gives you an idea of, of where you're at. So the theme says, uh, you know, I'm interested in reality-based characters and what happens, and I'm also interested in people who live in denial and what happens to them. They we're going to build a couple of these people, and then we're just going to let them run around. <laughs> um, and so in that, they have a lot of life, and yeah, and then you can avoid the didacticism. Considering the nature of this, this book, and I got to tell you, reading this book, it's, it's, it can be tough at times. I mean, mm. this, is, this, is not a, this is not all flowers and, and butterflies. Right. So, did you get depressed writing it? I actually, weirdly, when I write these kinds of books, I actually get less depressed. Um, I, um, I write a lot because I'm trying to sort of purge anxieties that I already have. You know, I worry, like I look at my 11-year-old son and I say, well, what, what kind of future are we giving you? Are we doing everything we can to give you the good future? And I have a great deal of anxiety that says, maybe we're not. Um, and so when I write something like The Water Knife that sort of describes that future that I worry about. Um, in a way, it's a way of putting it on a shelf and setting it outside of myself. A little cathartic at times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very much. Um, research, how much research and how much does this Just enough. <laughs> just, uh, I'll bet, because so, there's a lot of stuff going on in here. But how much do you have to make? It's in the future. It's, it's, it's science fiction slash fantasy, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But it has to be realistic to keep the, re the listener, the reader, I should say, uh, involved. So how do you balance that? Well, so Margaret Atwood has a term for her writing, and she thinks of, she thinks of writing anticipations. Um, and I think of myself as writing extrapolations. You're looking at some present moment, and you're sort of just trying to spin it out. And you say, if this goes on, what might the world look like? And so you start from that grounded present moment. And then as you go out into the future, that grounding helps. But there's other things where you're going to choose a lot of details to make sure that that world feels real and lived in and absolute. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, you know, the dusk mask that Lucy wears when she goes out into a giant uh, dust storm uh, is branded with REI logos. And, you know, you see things like Camelback and you see other major, you know, sort of corporate logos around. I've always sort of thought that the apocalypse will be accessorized. <laughs> and, and, but that also gives us a sense that there really is this real future and it really is connected right. to our present. There's a little Blade Runner-esque thing mm -hmm. happening there where you recognize something but then you don't recognize it. Right, but again, right. how do you do that without teaching people, without trying to teach, a, or do you want to teach a lesson here? Well, I think it's, I, I don't think you want to teach a lesson. I think you want to give people a chance to live inside of a different uh, skin. 
Um, I think that fiction's power is that it builds empathy. You get to live inside of somebody's skin that you don't know and have never cared about. And in this case, we're living inside of the future. The idea is that we go out into the future, whether that's 50 years or 100 years into the future, and we say, what does it feel like to live in the skin of a climate refugee? How does that feel? How scary is that? Um, and ideally, that empathy connection then comes back and it gives us another way to look at the world. Because a lot of times what I've noticed when we're talking about big issues like climate change is that people can get locked down in this, well, my facts say this, and my facts say that. And it's, it's sort of a pointless conversation. And so uh, you want to sort of move into that in a different way where it says, oh, this is what this feels like. Do we want to go this way? Maybe not. Well, you, you have certainly uh, set a scenario there in the landscape and made it very realistic. And uh, it's a great read. Thank you so much for joining us. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. And Thursday on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear about the 2015 Heart Ball to benefit the American Heart Association, and a local exhibit focuses on the anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.